Running to the faraway town Now war is declared And battle come down Ready. Brought my own drink. How are we today? Feeling good? Having a good time? Alrighty. So, as usual, I do this every six months, you know, state of Drupal. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about what, what we've accomplished in the last six months since I uh, spoke at uh, DrupalCon uh, Chicago. And then I'll also talk a little bit about the future of Drupal and where I think we need to go. Uh, it's going to be a pretty packed keynote, I think. There's a lot of information there. So hopefully you guys will not like zoom out or uh, you know, things like that. Uh, at the end of the keynote, <clears throat> there will be questions and answers. If you have a question during the keynote, just use the hashtag uh, DrupalCon keynote. Somebody will collect all the questions and then come up on stage to ask me some of these questions. So uh, that's what you do to, um, to get your question uh, asked. So before we start, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the Drupal Association, the DrupalCon organizers, and the many sponsors for making this possible. It's for them that we are here. And you know, they just put on one of the biggest, well, the biggest European DrupalCon. So give them a quick, quick applause. <laughs> this, this conference has been in, in the works for you know, over a year. So a lot of effort went into, the, into this to make uh, this possible. Um, so I've been traveling quite a bit. As, as most of you know, I do travel a lot. And as I travel, I meet developers, users, you know, organizations adopting Drupal. And what I've been seeing is that Drupal is being increasingly more adopted by large organizations, but also by small organizations, but large organizations that are really uh, starting to standardize on Drupal. And I think a prime example of that is happening in New York right now. Pretty much all of the large media companies, um, you know, about five or six, five or six years ago, um, wow, my stomach is a little... <laughs> <laughs> Five or six years ago, um, you know, they essentially used all sorts of different platforms. For their biggest websites, say CNN.com and, and these kinds of things, they would use System A. For the medium-sized websites, they would use B, C, and D, and then for their smaller websites, they would use something else. <clears throat> Today, though, um, more and more of these organizations are starting to standardize on Drupal as a platform for all of their medium-sized websites, as well as many of their low-end websites. Although on the low end, we often see uh, WordPress as well. And this is true for all of these brands that you see on the screen. So these are some of the biggest media companies in the world, all standardizing on Drupal as a platform, which obviously is great news for Drupal, right? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in my presentation. But the same thing is happening in other industries. Uh, Drupal is still doing extremely well in education. I think it's one of the, you know, one of the industries, if you will, where Drupal is being adopted the most. Um, Drupal is also doing, uh, you know, better and better in financial services uh, industry. And this is also very important because it's traditionally, uh, you know, a very conservative group of people, right? They're always the latest, or the last people, I should say, to adopt uh, a new uh, technology. And, um, you know, right now the Eurostar here in Europe is switching to Drupal for, you know, pretty much all of their sites. Same thing with the New York Stock Exchange in New York. Um, obviously will provide a lot of credibility to Drupal once they finally launched all of their sites. But, you know, more signs of Drupal being adopted uh, more and more. Government, obviously, you know, with the White House being a prime example, lots and lots of adoption in government still. Some of the sites are listed on the screen, but there's, you know, hundreds, hundreds more. Um, Drupal is also doing well in, you know, high tech. A lot of uh, Technology companies adopting Drupal, uh, the, the Twitter developer website switched to Drupal. Uh, Symantec is using Drupal, actually in a very interesting way. Um, I think it's worthwhile to pause there for a second. So what they have is Symantec.com slash connect. And it's a community website where you know, users can help provide support um, you know, for, for products and, and you know, solutions that they have. Um, and it's not the main semantic.com website, but it's a subsite. But they have more than 240,000 registered users. They have more than 740 or 750 pieces of content, questions that are being asked by people. And what they use this for is to essentially reduce their costs, because 95% of the questions that are, are being asked, support questions, are being answered by you know, 
volunteers in their community. So for Semantic, this is a huge success story. A huge success story enabled by Drupal to help them cut down on some of these expenses and to innovate the way they work as a company. So it's not just about you know building a quick website. It's really about fundamentally changing how they work and how they participate uh, with their customers. And we see that happen more and more. Um, so, <clears throat> so all in all, long version, you know, long story short, Drupal is being increasingly adopted across all industries. Truly, a global phenomena, if you will. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Drupal 7. Obviously, we released Drupal 7. Um, a lot of people have been concerned about the adoption of Drupal 7 relative to Drupal 6. We have a long way to go in terms of upgrading some of the key contributed modules. But at the same time, if you start looking at some of these statistics, then you can see that it took about 12 months for Drupal 6 to get to 100,000 websites, whereas it took uh, Drupal 7 only six months to get to the same number of websites. So although I think we're rightfully concerned about the adoption of these modules or the upgrading of these modules, I, I don't think we should you know, ignore the fact that Drupal 7 is being adopted rap more rapidly than any other version uh, of Drupal before. Um, <clears throat> same thing is true for people contributing to Drupal. Uh, number of commits per month has been increasing, especially since the Git migration. It really has spiked. Um, and also, the number of unique committers or unique contributors has been growing uh, month over month, as you can see in this graph. So again, um, you know, good news, more proof that Drupal is doing well. Um, in addition, yeah, <laughs> and some guy. <laughs> um, in addition, you know, thanks to Drupal 7, some of the new API, some of the innovation in Drupal 7, we're starting to see a lot of great things happen in the contributed modules repository. Uh, one of these examples is the Workbench module. I highly recommend that you check it out. It allows you to um, you know, better control, define editorial workflows. Another quick example um, is a media module. You know, asset handling, media handling, has all, always been a, a pain point in Drupal and has always been one of the top requested features. Now, there's a module which is being worked on by a number of people which will hopefully address this. And this module, again, leverages a lot of the innovations in Drupal 7. Uh, another example is a commerce module, which is you know, soon to be released. Um, again, great example of how we were able to reinvent ourselves or reinvent Drupal's commerce solution by leveraging uh, Drupal 7. And you know, very excited about commerce module. I think it's going to you know, expose Drupal to a whole new world, to you know, the large commerce world, which is uh, kind of humongous. So hopefully, that will be good news for Drupal as well. So, all in all, I would say, I think we have a lot to be proud of. You know, Drupal is being adopted more and more. Drupal 7 is being adopted more and more. We're seeing better and better modules every day. So, you know, let's give ourselves a, a quick applause for um, getting it this far. <laughs> at, at the same time, I think we have some interesting thing in our DNA, which is we're never quite happy, right? We're never happy. We're always super critical of ourselves. We're always complaining <laughs> about ourselves and the work that we do, which is actually a great feature, I think, or a, a great aspect of our culture. Um, so. In good tradition, if you will, I've organized another state of Drupal survey. I typically organize these at the beginning of every major development cycle. So the last time I organized one was in 2008. And I presented the results in Seget, which I don't know how many people have been to Seget, but it's been ages ago. Um, so it was time for us to do another one, right? And so in this keynote, I'm going to highlight some of the results, the results that I found interesting, um, you know, and present them to you. Um, after the keynote, I'll make sure to make all of the data available as well. So I'll upload a, a, an Excel file or something so people can do their own analysis of the data as well. Um, because it, there's too much you know, valuable data there for me to you know, talk about it in, in one session. Uh, but 3,000 people replied, which you know, I thought was a very impressive number compared to last time we had you know, just over 1,000 people. So, uh, 3,000 people, in my mind, means that the results are relevant, right? 
um, it's hard to discard some of these, uh, these data points. So before we get into the meat of it, um, let's take a look at who actually took the survey. Most people that took the survey, they labeled themselves as being proficient, and then there's experts and beginners. But then if we started to correlate the answers of multiple questions uh, together, we get something like this. Um, people call themselves beginners when they have less than two years of experience with Drupal, call themselves proficient when they have two to three years of experience, and call themselves experts when they have more than four years of experience. Um, what's also interesting is that people start off by calling themselves site builders. You know, they assemble websites through downloading and then configuring modules. And then as they become experts, they actually start to label, label themselves as developers. Uh, lastly, another interesting correlation is that most of the beginners, they look at Drupal as a hobby. It's what they do in their spare time. Um, when people are proficient, they make part of their income with Drupal, and experts or the developers tend to make all of their income with Drupal. So they're the full-time Drupal people, if you will. But most people, um, actually most people make most of their money with Drupal. So it's, you know, there is some, some gray area in between. Um, of course, you know, many other people took the survey. You can see some of the, you know, some of the names that, or the labels that people gave themselves. Um, I thought what's interesting is um, that only 1.1% of the people are marketing uh, people. Um, that even less people consider themselves salespeople. Um, this one was also surprising because I really think we could also use many more of them, which are uh, product managers. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I think usability experts still, you know, fairly small. So I think there's, you know, plenty of room, you know, to get more of these people inside of our community. I think at the end of the day, we want to build like a well-rounded community. That's what I call it in the past. And I still think that's very much true where we need to get more people in the community, especially, I think, these uh, areas. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in this keynote as well. Um, where do the people come from? Uh, most people actually came from North, uh, Western Europe, sorry. Um, second was North America. And then, you know, pretty much all of the other continents. So truly, again, Drupal being a global phenomena and that being represented in the results of the survey. As a, as a quick sideline, I thought it was pretty interesting that uh, Europe was actually bigger than uh, North America. I would not have expected that, but it's very consistent with what we, you know, with, 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 blah, with what I see, um, which is, you know, extreme adoption in Europe right now. I think Drupal is probably growing faster in Europe than it is in North America. Um, so before we get into the ugly, part, you know, the ugly parts of the survey. I did want to highlight this slide because um, you know, it's an important slide because uh, it sort of speaks to the fact that overall people are super excited about Drupal. People are really, really happy. Um, you know, as you can see, awesome was one of the top keywords that people filled out. And the question was pretty simple. It was just a text field, open in the text field. It was, please describe Drupal in one word. And this is what came out. So a lot of people um, thought Drupal was flexible and awesome. <laughs> um, which I think is great. Um, all right. So one of the other questions that I thought was interesting is, what is Drupal's biggest opportunity? And these are the results. I'll let you read them. But um, the important ones are probably the top three, right? Which is replacing legacy platforms and you know, mobile and IT cost reduction. To me, that was actually surprising, right? Because these are very busy business-like things to bubble up to the top. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, a little bit more about that. So I think what's happening um, with many organizations, you know, small ones, but you know, also very large ones, is that 10 years ago, these organizations had probably one website if they had a website. Um, nowadays, most organizations have lots and lots of websites. Even you know, small organizations that have their intranet, their extranet, they might have one or two microsites if they put on an event or you, know, you name it. And then the large organizations often have hundreds, and some of them have thousands of websites all around the world. Um, and so the way that actually came together is very organically. And as a result, 
um, these websites are being built by all sorts of different technologies, right? Uh, like, for example, they started out building their corporate website using vignettes. At some point, the CEO of the organization wanted to blog, and so they slapped on a WordPress blog, and they wanted to build an intranet, so they used SharePoint. And so today, many of these organizations are basically um, you know, a mess. <laughs> Uh, they have many, many different websites running many, many different uh, technologies as well. So some of it is, you know, Microsoft, PHP, Java, basically you name it. So it's pretty messy. And so what's happening right now is that a lot of these organizations are starting to realize that they can actually standardize on Drupal as a platform. Maybe not for all of the websites, right? Drupal definitely is not the right tool for every website. But for many of these, you know, websites, people can actually standardize on Drupal. Um, and, you know, that speaks directly to, I think, these two items, right? It's replacing some of the legacy platforms, and it also allows them to save money. It allows them to save money because there is no license fee, but also it allows them to save money because they can simplify their internal teams. I mean, you don't need to have experts in all of these different platforms to, you know, manage your web, all of your websites efficiently. And in fact, that's kind of what we see happening in the media and entertainment industry. So this is a real trend. Um, I've seen it myself. It seems to come out of the data. And I think it's surprising probably to many, maybe many of the developers in the audience, I would think. Or maybe not. Um, but obviously, this is sort of a big dream or a big vision, I should say, right? Sort of like making Drupal the platform to standardize on. <laughs> It's not a small thing to do, but um, at the same time, I do think Drupal is uniquely positioned um, to fulfill that dream or that vision, because I think maybe for the first time in history, uh, there is a platform like Drupal that has the reach, meaning has a very large install base, um, that has a scalability, and by that I mean can be used for small websites as well as for large websites. Now, traditionally, that wasn't the case. Like, you would never use, say, a vignette to build a microsite because it just, I mean, it would be insane. <laughs> it would be too expensive um, to begin with, and it would be too complex um, as well. Right? So Drupal scales from large to small websites. And then third, it has the flexibility to be many different things. Because of the, the way we architected the system, because of the fact that we have thousands of contributed modules, people can effectively build any kind of website by putting together the right modules. And distributions uh, specifically will only help accelerate that because they're like distributions optimized for intranets. There's distributions uh, you know, optimized for other things and so forth. So I think of all the op open source CMSs, of all the CMSs in the world, I think Drupal is sort of at the right time and at the right place to really fulfill this big vision. It's a big vision, uh, but I think it's possible. So let's talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> so here is, here is where it gets interesting as well, although probably a little bit more predictable. But another question in the survey was, who do we compete with? Um, and more than a third of the people said WordPress. Um, um, a lot of people said Joomla. Uh, typo 3 and so forth. So the majority, majority of the people, is that me or? <laughs> the majority of the people um, you know, basically mentioned open source systems. You know, very few actually mentioned these legacy systems <laughs> that we were going to replace in the previous question. So what's up with that? Um, and so anyway, I think we need to be very careful when we say we compete with WordPress because we shouldn't confuse the competition with the opportunity. The opportunities go after all of these legacy systems, as was shown in the previous results. And the competition might be WordPress, but it's WordPress beating us at fulfilling that vision. Competition is not us replacing WordPress sites. That's a completely different thing. And I think it's very important that we realize that, because otherwise, we're going to be stuck in this thing in our brains, you know, trying to compete with WordPress at the wrong level, right? And the competition might be WordPress, it might be other systems, but um, 
It's a race, potentially, to get to this vision, rather than a race to capture, say, the low end of the market, which I think a lot of people have in their minds. Um, so, you know, let's think bigger. Let's expand our, our uh, horizon. Let's actually start to investigate some of these other systems. It's great that we all know a lot about WordPress, but there is a hundred other systems where the real opportunity might be. So, let's, uh, let's keep that in mind. <clears throat> Another thing which I think we all experience pretty much every day, <laughs> but which also came out of the survey results, is that there is these trade-offs, right? Uh, on the one hand, we want to make it easy for people to get into the community. We want to be accessible through our website by making Drupal easy to use, by making Drupal easy to develop for, all of these things. And at the same time, we have this desire to be better and better at the technology. We're adding these features. We're adding things like configuration management. Uh, you know, basically, we're adding complexity because we have a desire to be the best at the technology aspect as well. And of course, these two uh, create a little bit of tension. Um, and so that's demonstrated by the survey results. Um, so one of the, you know, I think, you know, this is a question that I already, um, actually, I didn't talk about this yet, but the question was, what are Drupal's biggest challenges? And like, even in the top two answers, I think you see some of that tension, right? Configuration management, you know, great feature, but highly technical feature, right? It's not necessarily going to improve the usability of Drupal for developers. Um, it's going to improve the usability for people doing deployments, but it sort of is at odds with the desire to be very easy to use. We also see it in the next um, section. So there was another question, which was, what makes Drupal awesome? And the number two answer was the number of available modules. <laughs> and then the number three answer with the biggest challenges was, you know, what's challenging is that there's so many modules. <laughs> Um, and of course, it's no surprise, but I, you know, it's another example of this tension. Um, yet another example. Um, so another question was, um, you know, is Drupal a hobby, a part-time thing, or a full-time job, effectively? Where do you make your money? And in Seget, in 2008, the results looked like this. Um, you know, today, the results look like this. So. Although the number of hobbyists might have increased in absolute numbers, in relative numbers, it actually became smaller. And the number of people that make a living with Drupal increased you know, significantly, I would say. And that also creates tension. Again, because in a way, we measure the success of our community by our ability to attract hobbyists, to attract newbies into the project. Um, and at the same time, we're also maturing as a community to be um, you know, more professional, I guess. We're, you know, many more professionals. Um, and, you know, I think people experience that. I think people experience that every day, and that creates some of this, you know, some of these debates that we have, all healthy debates. Um, so, and again, it's important because, you know, as, you, as I showed in an earlier slide, um, hobbyists are, in a way, like the supply lines <laughs> to our community. It's how people get involved. And so, again, um, we need to be very careful about that. Um, at the same time, this increasing amount of complexity is also very natural. If you look at most technologies, like the cell phone, it's basically, you know, over time, these things get more and more functionality, more and more power. At the same time, their complexity increases with that, you know, functionality increase. Um, however, I think, you know, Apple, I think, is an example of, you know, of a, or the iPhone, I should say, is an example of, of a cell phone that was able to break this paradigm. At least for me, and people might differ, uh, but to me, it's one of the, one of the most powerful uh, cell phones that I've ever had. And at the same time, it's the, the one that's the easiest to use. So they've done a great job combining those two, two things in one. So it, can, it, it is possible, but it takes a lot of rigor. It takes a lot of you know, work to get there. Um, so, in a way, I think we need to, you know, we have this tension between uh, usability and, you know, complexity, added functionality, but I really truly believe that we sort of need to get over ourselves a little bit, <laughs> and that we need to embrace this, because it's, 
it's not going to change, right? Usability is becoming increasingly important. It's important to get people in the community, but it's also important for people, you know, sort of in the enterprise, if you will. Everybody cares about usability. Um, and I talked about this in Chicago a little bit as well, but there is this trend which people refer to um, as a consumerization of IT. And it effectively means that people, they used to be cool with using a terminal, you know, like black and green. But in today's world, thanks to mobile, thanks to, you know, all of these other emerging technologies, people actually come to expect a, you know, a very easy, uh, or, you know, a lot of easy, what's the word? They come to expect an experience which is effectively delightful, you know, very easy to use. And so we have to make Drupal easier to use. We have no choice but to make Drupal easier to use. At the same time, we have no choice but to add functionality. I mean, what are we gonna do? Stop adding functionality? Um, so, you know, we must embrace this tension. We need to get over ourselves and we need to figure out how to deal with this. And part of that will actually be getting more people involved in the community, more usability experts, maybe product managers, all of these people, and to rethink some of the, you know, some of uh, our processes. Um, all right, <clears throat> this is interesting too. Um, and I might be using a dirty word, um, but how do we increase uh, Drupal adoption? Um, you know, 60% of the people said, we need to build a better product, which I, I agree, it's a great way to improve adoption. Uh, some people said uh, more training and other people said more marketing. Um, you know, reality, is that these two, you know, these things serve a different purpose. Like, we can't just rely on building a better product because Drupal 8, I don't want to like announce a release date or something, but it might be two years out from now, right? I mean, we cannot sit still and do, you know, not really help, you know, promote adoption. Um, I mean, it's not sufficient to basically say, we're gonna work on Drupal 8 and two years from now we're gonna, you know, we're gonna increase adoption thanks to Drupal 8. I mean, there is long-term things we need to do, which is making a better product, and there is short-term things we need to do, which is actually training more Drupal people and actually doing some marketing around Drupal. Um, I think a prime example is Drupal 7. We've spent, you know, three years of our lives with a thousand people working on Drupal 7. You know, we made it the best release ever, and then once it was released, we hardly marketed, you know, Drupal 7. Right? It's like, oh, here it is, <laughs> have fun. Um, and as a result, there's still a lot of myths around Drupal 7. People still complain about the fact that Drupal is hard to use. And you know, yes, we need to make Drupal you know, even easier to use, but we've made so many great improvements to Drupal 7. We've not successfully changed the minds of the bigger world about some of the great things which we've added to Drupal 7. And I think that's because we don't talk about it enough because we didn't promote Drupal 7 enough, because we didn't really explain all the great things which are new in Drupal 7, um, you know, well enough. Uh, another great example, if you want to compete with WordPress, <laughs> would be to look at the WordPress website. I mean, here's their showcase. Uh, as you can see, they use sc screenshots. Look at that. They have ratings, um, you know, all of these things. If you compare that to the showcase on D.O., which by the way is one click away from the main page and where a ton of people go to, it looks like this. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's not really showing that we're proud of what we've built, that we're proud of you know, how people use Drupal. So I think you know, getting better at simple things, it doesn't need to be like putting up billboards in cities. It's just making our website a little bit easier to use and a little bit more attractive for people, I think would come a long way in, in helping to promote our market Drupal. So let's make sure we invest enough time in our website. Let's make sure that we give the Drupal Association a mandate to you know, invest more in promotion and marketing as well. Plus, and that's the last slide on marketing, I believe. Actually, no. <laughs> um, it's also a very natural, you know, it's very natural as, as technologies evolve as products evolve, they go from being primarily engineering driven to actually being, you know, more marketing driven. That's how you get them to get them you get them out there. Um, and that's been true for pretty much everything. There is ex, you know exceptions. Um, and it, it even 
I think relates to this, right? I mean, we see our biggest opportunities replacing legacy platforms and IT cost reduction. There is very little code, there is very little engineering that we need to do, you know, to go after these opportunities. It's primarily a marketing driven opportunity where we need to tell the story. We need to tell people the vision. We need to give them use cases. We need to give them examples. There is very little, you know, again, engineering that needs to be done. That's not to say that we can't improve on the engineering side, but it's not necessarily where most of the action needs to be if we want to go after these two uh, opportunities. That's different for mobile, though. Um, all right, so I think, you know, how do we win in general? I think um, you need to have these three things. You need to have the, you know, the best technical platform. It needs to be easy to use, and it needs to be well marketed. And there's, you know, hundreds of examples um, of, um, you know, of organizations. Um, you know, Apple, almost all of us have Apple devices. I think they're winning because, you know, they do all of these things really well. If you compare that to another cell phone manufacturer, Nokia, they're not exactly winning. I don't think they're as strong technically as the iPhone, and it's definitely not as easy to use as the iPhone. They're doing a ton of marketing, though, so just marketing is not enough. Um, if you look at Drupal, I would say we're, you know, we're sort of roughly like this. I think very strong technical product compared to many other solutions. You know, we're okay in terms of easy, you know, ease of use. We're much better than some of the legacy platforms. We're not always as good as some of the open source platforms. So there's room for improvement. Is it well marketed? Mm, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. So um, that, I think, is how we eventually uh, will win. All righty. So let's talk a little bit about how we will win on the technical side and how we can make Drupal better technically. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Drupal 8. Um, so in Chicago, I actually spent a lot of time talking about Drupal 8, and I made some announcements around Drupal 8. First of all, I sort of revised the development process, announced this concept of initiatives. Um, since then, I announced a few initiatives in my keynote, uh, and I've added a couple since, but you know, web services, HTML5, a design initiative to add a new core team um, to Drupal 8. Configuration management and internationalization are five, the five active initiatives that we have. Um, for each of those, we've identified an initiative lead. Um, you can see their picture on the screen. Uh, and we have, every two weeks, we have a two-hour meeting with each of them, uh, or with all of them, uh, and they give a status update. So you can see a quick status update on the slides. Overall, I would say they're doing well. We've, we've had some patches committed. Uh, some of the bigger initiatives, like the web services and the, conf and the um, uh, configuration management initiative, um, don't have patches in Drupal 8 yet, but we're getting pretty close. Uh, because they're so big, they take a little bit more planning um, and a little bit more architecture and prototyping. Uh, but overall, I would say we are making good progress um, on, on all of those. So quick applause for you know, all of these five guys. <laughs> Right, so the other thing I announced um, was this concept of gates, right? The initiatives, what it actually allows me to do is to accept bigger patches instead of hundreds of small patches. But for a bigger patch to get in, they actually need to pass a number of gates, like there's a performance gate, there's an accessibility, usability, documentation, and testing gate. When I announced them in, Ch in Chicago, um, they weren't really well defined, and a lot of people ask, like, so what does it mean to pass the, you know, accessibility gate? So, what we've done since then, you know, with the help of, of uh, WebChick, is we've actually, got, you know, defined those initiative, uh, these gates, sorry, with the help of, um, you know, of other people in, in the community. So it was a very collaborative effort, and I think we're very, very close to, basically, having them uh, well documented. Um, so, you know, expect the two yellow ones to switch to green, you know, probably by the end of the week. Um, they're very close. So, again, good progress. Uh, something else which I announced was that there would be a threshold for the number of critical bugs. Um, at no time you would have more than 15 critical bugs in Drupal 8, specifically Drupal 8. 
And so whenever there is more critical bugs, I would stop accepting big patches, and we needed to shift focus on fixing uh, critical bugs as a measure to keep the quality of Drupal 8 um, you know, sort of sane, <laughs> and to avoid a situation like we had with Drupal 7, where we have hundreds of critical bugs, and we needed to spend months and months to work down the list of critical bugs. Um, since then, we've actually revised those thresholds, and you can read them on the screen, but we've revised them in such a way that we can actually balance um, progress on Drupal 7 with Drupal 8. Because one of the big questions was, so why are we working on Drupal 8 if Drupal 7 still has these, you know, this many major bugs? And so with these new thresholds, we're able to make sure that we make progress where we need to make progress, and that we don't run ahead of ourselves with Drupal 8. Um, so they're all documented as well if you want to learn more about these. Um, so, in short, I think, you know, since six months ago, since I announced these things in Chicago, we actually made, you know, a lot of good progress. Uh, but is there more to do? Uh, and I think the answer is yes. Um, I think the answer is yes, because if we look at some of the survey results again, one of the questions was, what are the top challenges? And I've, I've, I've shown these before, but usability came out first configuration management and content uh, staging were considered to be the top ch challenges according to more than 3,000 people. Um, what are the top developer requests? Uh, HTML5 came out first. Better APIs and content import and export were the top three requested features. Um, I thought content import and export was interesting because maybe, maybe it's related to the legacy replacement opportunity where people want to be able to move existing websites to Drupal. Um, and then another question was, as an end user, what are your, um, you know, what are your top feature requests? And end users asked for media and asset handling, mobile support, and WYSIWYG support. So no surprises there, I think. We've seen that for a while. So what I've done here is I've effect effectively taken these nine items, um, I sorted them by um, response counts. So we have a prioritized list, if you will. And this is sort of the top nine requests, if you will, um, from you know, a community as a whole. Um, so I think one of the goals we should have for Drupal 8 is to basically knock down this list. Seems reasonable. <laughs> it's backed by data. I think if you look at the items, at least for me, they're sort of in line with my gut feeling. Like, you know, yes, we need to do all of these things. And so the remainder of the presentation, I wanted to give you a quick overview of where we are relative to these nine items. So I have a little scorecard for each. So obviously, HTML5, I think, I would say is green. It's on track. Um, we have in the issue queue over 1,000, uh, over 100, sorry, <laughs> over 100 HTML5 issues which we basically need to work through. Um, but overall, I think we're on track to, to sort of nail this um, thing. Uh, media and asset handling, there is no official initiative for this. Um, I think what people want is they want to be able to manage files through a file browser, um, but also you know, better support for audio and video. Um, so I think what we need to do, and maybe we can start this week, here at, at the conference. We need to figure out what that means. We need to figure out what it is that we want to accomplish in Drupal 8. Um, and then once we have defined the, the goals, you know, we should consider launching an initiative uh, for this. And you know, if we feel that's a good idea, I would go out and, and try and find uh, an initiative owner as well over the next, I don't know, in the next six months. <laughs> um, Usability. This one is an, an interesting one for me because it's somewhat covered by a gate, although, you know, that, you know, obviously, at least to me, that wouldn't be enough. I think there's much more we can do. Um, we've done some formal usability testing, so I think we have a, a sense of, you know, areas where we can improve things. Um, but there is, there is a lot there, right? So where do we focus? What would it mean to define an initiative around usability? So I think we need to come up with a more narrow set of goals, like are we going to go after the editorial um, workflow experience or are we going to do something completely different? So again, uh, we'd love to get some impact, input uh, from people in the audience and from people 
you know, not a DrupalCon, see if we can formulate an initiative around uh, usability. Uh, mobile support. <laughs> this one is interesting because it's partially covered by the HTML5 initiative, which will make it easier to build mobile websites. It's also covered by the design initiative because one of the objectives of the design initiative is to make, um, you know, to make the new team, which we like to add to Drupal 8, uh, mobile friendly. Um, and it's also partially covered by the web services initiative because that will actually enable us to build uh, native uh, applications for iOS or Android and other devices. So in a way, we're doing a lot of things to make you know, mobile a top priority, but I think there's always more we can do, especially given how important mobile is. Um, I think we should think about maybe converting all of the existing teams in Drupal 8 to be mobile friendly. Um, I think we should consider adopting responsive uh, design in all of our teams. Um, there's things we can do around scaling of images if we serve them to mobile devices. Should we build a native application for Drupal? You know, that could be cool. And so again, I think we need to define what it is that the next steps will be, see if there's one or more initiatives that come out of this. Um, WYSIWYG, um, you know, we obviously aren't doing much about this, um, but it's something that people have been asking for. I know Sun has some ideas. I know Quick Sketch has some ideas. Um, so I think we should get together, talk about them, see if we can, you know, have a WYSIWYG editor in core. Um, so uh, better APIs. I think a lot of developers feel this pain um, where we need to make Drupal easier to use. So do we need to you know, look for ways to simplify Drupal, to improve the consistency of Drupal? Um, should we look for ways to adopt some of the modern design patterns in engineering? I think the answer is yes to all of these questions. Uh, and we're actually doing a lot of that through the Web Services API and to some extent also through the configuration management uh, stuff. Um, but there might be more to do. Um, so let's, let's work on that. Um, configuration management, we you know, happen to have an initiative for that, so it's green. Um, I think, in short, I would say this initiative needs some more people to help. <laughs> I think there's good ideas, there's progress, but um, we need more people to get involved. Um, content import export, again, partially covered by some of the in existing initiatives, but again, more that can be done. So um, let's see if we can define goals. Let's see if we can find champions to run with this and you know, make them official initiative owners. And then finally, uh, content staging, which obviously is a big deal for many. Um, I think this one will actually be enabled by the uh, configuration management initiative. So it's a little bit blocked on that. So the way I like to think about it is that we don't actually start anything here unless we've made enough progress with the configuration management initiative. So, so what I want to do with these, with these core cards, I think they're quite handy. So I would like to maybe move them online, have a place uh, on D.O. or elsewhere where we can basically track them and update them along the way. Maybe my next keynote, I'll quickly run over them again see what progress we've made. Uh, but I think it's a good way for us to know what's going on, what progress has been made. Um, I think if we do all of these things, you know, Drupal 8 will be, uh, you know, obviously be a great release, which satisfies the needs of, of you know, many of us. Um, two quick caveats, I would say, which is, I mean, it, there's a lot of other things which came out of the survey, like, views like stuff in core, um, better separation between products and framework, you know, all of these things which didn't bubble up to the top nine, that doesn't mean we can't work on them, right? It's still okay for you to work on whatever you're passionate about. I think Drupal is built on passion, so find the things that you're most passionate about. However, um, if you wanna inject yourself straight to the middle of the community, make sure to work on things that matter. Make sure to inject yourself in the critical path because that will give you a lot of visibility, a lot of exposure. And so if you, if you care about those things, work on these nine things. Um, and also I think in our conversations, um, let's not forget about these nine things because we tend to talk about specifics. Um, 
you know, we tend to talk sometimes about issues which are not in the top nine, which is great, and uh, we should continue to do so, but let's not, let's make sure we don't spin our wheels talking just about these things and then forget about, you know, other big topics. So, um, so essentially, to wrap up this keynote, um, you know, I think we have a huge opportunity ahead of us. I think, again, we're uniquely positioned to, you know, basically change our industry to change the way people build websites, to change the way people manage dozens or hundreds of websites. Um, and I think it also came out of the survey results. Um, so as we go after this, let's make sure we truly understand the competition, that we're not blindsided you know, by one or two. Um, and I think the way we go after this is by making sure Drupal continues to be you know, the best CMS out there, to make it really really strong. And to do that, you know, let's focus on Drupal 8. Let's make Drupal 8 a really, really great release at the same time. Let's continue to invest and, and make progress on um, these contributed modules, like the media module um, and others. Um, let's really focus on ease of use. And also, let's start to embrace ugly words like promotion and marketing. It doesn't mean you have to do it. <laughs> But at least let other people do it. Let the Drupal Association do it. You know, let's get more of these people in our community, because at the end of the day, all they want to do is you know carry out all of the great work we've done and help peop other people get into Drupal uh, by doing so. And so, with that, um, I'd like to say thank you. Um, Thanks. There should be some time for uh, questions and answers, I believe. Um. Hi, Dries. Uh, I've been told we only have time for two questions from our Twitter stream. I've talked too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the first questions that came up was, are there any major sites running Drupal 7 at the moment? Um, it's a good question. Um, well, there is the um, there is a, there is a quite a few of them, but I'm trying to come up with a, with a good example. Um, Examiner.com Examiner would be a huge website, actually. Um, it's sorry, I couldn't hear it. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> As of representatives, so there is plenty. We should make a list. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on, on good examples. <laughs> and then, if I aggregate a few questions, you mentioned a lot about the need for marketing and the marketing-driven mm -hmm. future and where we want to go, but what, is the community able to do that, or you, do you really need the Drupal Association to take control? Does it need a top-down approach to create simplicity from our growing complexity? Right. Um, so I, th I think it would be helpful if the Drupal Association, I mean, we need to talk about that as a Drupal Association, but I think it would be very helpful if the Drupal Association would take a lead um, in that, but then work with, you know, everyone basically that want to participate in, um, in sort of, you know, carrying out what that means to do marketing. And, uh, you know, it means a lot of different things, right? So we need a lot of people to help, but I think when it comes to marketing, I think there needs to be some ownership whether it's in the Drupal Association or whether it's with somebody outside of the Drupal Association or you know, a small team outside of the Drupal Association. But I think it would be helpful if there was some consistency in how we talk about Drupal, how we promote Drupal, and if there was a vision behind that as well. So I think it would be helpful if the Drupal Association would take this on. Um, so, yeah. All right. No more questions. Only told to do two. All right. So I'll be around all week. <laughs> If you have questions, um, you know, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thanks, Dries.